this this topic, this word that continues to come up around privilege, around privilege, um, specifically white privilege. Um, so share your perspective with us on what what does white privilege mean? How do we see it show up? How should it should not should it not be used? To, enlighten us on on this this word, this topic of privilege. So you got to give that one to the white guy on the panel, I guess. That's the, well, that's the way know. it works, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's my privilege to give you an answer. Well, we talk about that a lot because at the core of this conversation is that if white folks don't recognize that we do have privilege, then we can't actually be anti-racist. We can't actually be allies. So it, it's kind of like it has to start there to be able to have a new way of seeing things. So in our in our work, we frequently hear white folks push back on that two word expression, white privilege, and they say, I'm sick and tired of people implying that because I'm white, I've had things easy. I had to work my way through high through college. My parents couldn't afford to pay for college. I came out of school with debt. Um, you know, I have not had an easy road. And uh, I try to start from that point to say let's let's focus on this idea of being born with a silver spoon in your mouth we all have heard that expression so can you acknowledge that if somebody is born into one of those northeastern you know wealthy wealth of carnegie i don't even know who they are the carnegies the the you, give me one i don't know the rockefellers right that obviously they would have access to more privileges than me growing up in south central pennsylvania on a farm with a dad with an associate's degree who you know struggled to put food on the table obviously that rich guy would have more privileges than my family they, they get that idea so then the way i kind of lay it out is if you're a guy can you acknowledge that you have some privileges in this world that was built by men for men Think about the the tree, the roots of that tree. You know, women women didn't have the right to vote. Women uh, were seen as um, property of men. They couldn't have credit cards. I mean, we don't have to go back that far to see how things were and are still unfair for women. I and sometimes if a guy is honest, I'll say, "Would you rather be a guy or a woman in our culture?" Rarely does a guy. I'm just pulling back the curtain on the guy world. Rarely does a guy say, "I would love to be a woman." And we recognize that we have things easier because we're men in this culture and society. I don't have to work. I've never worried about sexual assault. Every woman I know has worried about sexual assault or has been sexually assaulted or knows someone who's been sexually assaulted. So then I'm like, well, it's not much of a step to go to race because the tree was built by white folks to benefit white folks. The, the roots of the tree are um, still there to, to benefit white folks. And um, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to meander, but I have shared, maybe y'all have seen it. Um, if you know my Shiro, um, she calls herself America's first diversity trainer, Jane Elliott, who was the third grade teacher, another resource that folks listening in, if you just find on um, pbs.org, the episode called A Class Divided, she, she's a, a racial justice warrior, a white woman. And she a video clip always circulates around on social media of her in a lecture hall with an all white a college audience. And it's powerful. She says white folks in this audience, they pan. There's no non white folks in the audience. She goes stand up. If you would be willing to trade places with black folks and have their experience in the United States versus yours and nobody stands up, the camera pans out to 200 people in the auditorium. And she's fiery. She says, perhaps you didn't understand my question. I said, stand up if you'd be willing to change places with black people in our society. And then when no one stands up, she says, you have just acknowledged that you have privilege based on your skin color. And if you aren't using that to fight, to dismantle the system that's putting your, your, citizen, your fellow citizens at a disadvantage, then you are playing into the system that was created for your benefit and you're still like you're acknowledging that you're still benefiting and so this goes back to Shelton saying what are you going to do about it when you see the systemic process in your organization or in your neighborhood or in your schools 
Uh, what are you going to do about it? If you don't try to dismantle it, then you're a passive supporter. You're, you're, a, you're tacitly saying, I like my privilege. If I let other people have equity, then I might lose some of my privilege. And therein lies the whole, you know, to me, it's the whole source of the issue is white folks, not all white folks, but a lot of white folks are nervous about if the pie becomes equitable, am I going to have less pie? <laughs> That's real. And, uh, I, this is probably my closing statement. I want to give other people a chance to talk, but I was thinking today in the shower, which is where I have all my good ideas getting ready for this panel, that because of the way I grew up, it wasn't until I was 33 years old and I was on a diversity training project with IBM and I was assigned um, to work many, 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 many days with um, African American women, we co presented back in those days. It wasn't until those deep, long conversations at 33 years of age that I started to see race from the perspective of outside of myself and started to recognize wow, I haven't had experiences in my life that have caused me, I'm a gay man and I haven't, I've, I, I, ha I haven't had nearly the amount of pain and um, um, frustration and barriers that my friends of color have had. And, um, and then that's, that was the piece I wanted to share that we, we share in our workshops that um, something called contact theory is the, is the really the only way to disrupt biased patterns of thinking. And it, it can't just be one of my friends at work is black. It can't be some of my friends in college were black, whatever we white people say sometimes to say, I'm not racist. And then we provide, if you have to provide an explanation of why you're not racist, you might be racist. I don't know if that's the case, but, um, and, and so therein lies the final thing that I'll say is if it's a, it's a conundrum, if we can't have significant deep relationships with people that are different than us, we can't rewire the way we see the world. And at the same time, I tell my white friends, don't rely on black folks to educate you on on what the problems are because they, they're always asked to solve the problems. We are the ones that should be diving into the books, the movies, and we need to reach across and say, hey, let's have coffee. And I wanna talk to you and I'm nervous because I think I might ask something that sounds ignorant. Um, you know, to develop, to, we have, you get where I'm going with this, unless white folks take uh, the chance to, build significant, solid, trusting relationships with people that are different, we're destined to be in the same conversation a year from now, two years from now. And then I, this is my final thing that we use a lot of expressions around water to talk about why we have to stay in this if we care about it. We, we will get weary, but if we, if we step out, then we're obviously we're not a part of the process. So I was thinking about that story about it made a difference to that starfish. If you don't know the story, you can Google all these. That's the punchline. Um, <laughs> we're, we're throwing pebbles into the lake and creating ripples, and we don't know how far the ripples will go. Um, we're, we're, we're like a wave on the ocean. We can't see the whole ocean, but we're part of it. Like so many expressions about water. I'm determined till the end of my days to keep doing, even if they're perceived as little things, because I can't boil the ocean. That's, that's another one, another one around water. Um, I'm determined to keep doing the little things that I can from where I am with what I have. So I want that to be my last word because we're coming up on the end of the clock. <laughs> well, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you.